Sure, so talking about poly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So so I'll be talking about high level loop optimizations in LVM. Um, so this is a talk about poly, a tool I've been developing in LVM, not myself alone, but with a couple of other people. And so just before I really start with the talk, I would be interested did anybody of here here of you hear about poly already? Okay, a lot of people. Okay, like is, if anybody of you gets bored, because I kind of repeat a little bit, there's a couple of new stuff in those slides, so if anybody gets bored, please just complain and like we can, or like, let's, let's say it differently. If you get bored, find something you're really interested in and we're gonna go a lot deeper into that because it's, yeah, it's a little overview and a couple of things I'm going a little bit deeper. And the next thing is I like very interactive talks. So again, that's motivating, like interrupting me whenever you can. So we skip the useless slide about myself. Um, and we start about like, what is poly? So this is written above. Um, so basically it's high level loop transformation framework for LVM. Um, it works on the LVM compiler IR, so on the low level IR. And it basically, it models only memory accesses, statements and how they are executed in a loop, so loop iterations basically, and their execution order. And what we explicitly do not model are the low level instructions or the CFG as you normally see it on LVM IR. So, I just start with an example to kind of get people going. Um, uh, just put it on the slide and wonder, do you understand what I put here? Do you see this relation? So basically it's a loop transformation framework, so it's obviously we have a loop. And this is very interesting because that doesn't work at all. Because here there is a statement. <laughs> and okay, so that does not work. But that does also not work, just a second. You mm -hmm. ah. best fit. Ah. Wonderful. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. So yeah, this is the loop, and this is the statement written in a little bit kind of detached way. And the interesting piece is that kind of like this is a C loop as you kind of know it. Normally, when Polly is working on LVMI, all this stuff looks very very different. Um, for the moment, we don't care about that. What interesting is is to figure out like what is the relation between the actual loops and the mathematical representation we are using. I don't like the mouse here. So um, basically, the very first line where I can't jump up gives the domain, the domain of um, the statement that basically says which iteration of or which instances of this statement will be executed. And as you see, the domain is kind of like just basically just copied from the loop bounds. So we have constraints on i, we have constraints on j, and the domain is two-dimensional because we have two loops around the statement. The next information we have is um, the memory accesses of those statement. So we have two read accesses and two write accesses, which are actually also trivially just copied over. And we have something that's called s, the schedule. So what is the schedule? And so the point about the modeling above it's basically the domain or the set of statement instances that will be executed. This does not provide any information about when will those statements be executed. It's just a set of iterations without any specified order. And so that's where the schedule comes into the game. The schedule basically is a map. It takes a statement instance and maps it to a multidimensional time. And basically the schedule is the, well, the piece of the model that basically provides us with the information when is a statement instance executed. Basically by just ordering all the statement instances according to their multidimensional time using lexicographic order. And so I also illustrated this, we have basically we have the points, each point is a um, statement instance that will be executed. We have dependencies between those two points. So they are currently not modeled here, but you can calculate them from the loopness and you basically figure out um, due to this kind of memory access pattern, you figure out that this instance statement is, for example, depends on a value written in a previous instance. So those little errors give you the dependencies. <coughs> and now the interesting thing is this is a loop transformation framework. So obviously what do we want to do? We want to do loop transformations. So uh, one of the most effective loop transformations is tiling. So I just did this loop transformation. And I was very, very quick. That's because it's just a slide. But the point is, I need a point there, in fact. 
Anyway, so what you see is basically the only interesting thing is the schedule that is modified here. So we basically we add two dimensions and we um, use a floor division by three to kind of so basically to introduce the stride of three here. So we basically we get going steps of three into each direction and this allows us to group the statement instances into blocks. Now this kind of blocking is very effective if you want to optimize for um, data locality. You, well, people call it cache blocking or register blocking depending for where you, on which level you apply the blocking. And it allows you to, to um, take advantage of data reuse. So the classical problem is like you normally would execute all the points on one line and then all the points on the next line. And whenever you reach the first point, all of the values that you stored in your cache have been pushed out of the cache because there was so much computation happening in between. And if you do the computation local within one of those blocks, you still have all your values in cache and the program is extremely fast. And yeah, that you can do that on multiple levels, but we'll see that later. And now this is one of my new slides. So because basically I'm always talking about Poly and say that it's a great tool, but honestly Poly is not that interesting. What it makes it really, really interesting is the kind of ecosphere Poly is based off. So Poly is basically just the polyhedral optimizer for LVM, but most of the actual core computation is performed in a library called ISL, which is not only the math library, but also the library that connects basically the math with the abstract modeling. So we have um, we have dependence analysis there, we have a scheduling there that basically magically derives the optimal schedule to, to enable blocking um, and data reuse. We have a code generation framework there. And basically this guy there, he doesn't move, but it's when he did most of the work, and actually all the work in ISL. And another very interesting tool is ISL Python, which basically gives you an almost complete Python interface to ISL. So if, uh, whenever you want to hack a transformation, you just I just use Python and play around with it. It looks, um, yeah, try out whatever I'd like. And now going back to, to Poly, that's actually a very nice and fast way to try new transformations for LVM. Because you just play in Python a little bit and try your transformation. And as we all use the same library, it will almost directly translate to LVM. There's ISO plot to visualize ISO, ISL objects. Um, there is PET in case you want to translate your C code to a polyhedral representation. Um, there is PPCG, our um, C to CUDA translation tool, which in fact is also a very, very interesting tool because it allows you to, um, oh. like, we the, use the it. The chat room uh, is, uh, clo is was supposed to close at 5, right? Right. But yeah. It's half past. Well, we have still 20 minutes. <laughs> if that's okay. I, I just didn't sleep enough. So. Yeah. Good night. <laughs> okay, so we're still here. Yeah, I have. <laughs> Wait a minute. I'm going to hurry up. So, what we were just telling Pat is a C, C translator takes C code and it creates a political description. I, I use it, like, you can either use it if you just, if you already manually specify your input code. I use it to actually understand, like, it's very, it's more straightforward to, to write a C program and, and start from that doing your experiments than trying to write a C program or directly LVMIR and do your experiments. So normally if you kind of like try a new transformation, I would start with a C program, I would implement my transformation either in our C2C source to source compiler or with like from C over Python. You like, you try your stuff out and then you port it to LVM and basically it will work there too. So how is that different from a combination of Clang plus Poly? So, so the difference is um, Clang plus Poly, Clang is lowering the LVMIR mm -hmm. and we actually, we, you're very good that you asked that exactly the <laughs> next slide, I fully <laughs> forgot about that. So that's basically the difference between a semantic analysis and an AST pattern matching. And so what PET does is AST pattern matching. It's extremely good in that, that basically it can match a for loop, it can match uh, like this ternary conditions, and it's actually extremely precise. So if you specify something in, in C, PET can understand it and translate it into our mathematical model, it's very precise. Using LD, uh, Clang and Poly is not precise at all. So you will lose information on the way, 
where the analysis in poly may not be able to recover information. But on the other side, if you have something like, for example, uplast, like an expression template C++ library, which pet can just not pattern match, so poly actually understands it. And the reason is that we basically we use LVM semantical analysis. So for example, like both of the tools require structured control flow. But PET wants to see it. Poly wants LVM to understand it. So if there's a loop, and the LVM loop analysis understands there's a loop, Poly knows there's a loop. And well, if you have C++ iterators, after inlining all that stuff, they normally form a loop. And the very same thing for, for, for branches and induction variables, for example. I think like this is one of the examples I always try to show. So this is one of the programs Poly likes like, it, Poly is perfectly fine analyzing such kind of programs because basically after lowering C to LDMIR, programs look like this. And people would say, okay, normally you don't write a program with so many pointers and with do while and maybe some crazy stuff, but basically actually people do. It's not just C++ templates that create such programs, but like if you have a couple of macros and something, in an actual production system you very, very quickly end up, just by accident, with such kind of programs. And so the other thing is, for example, like the area accesses, which are actually pointer accesses. On LVM IR, we only have pointers. So Poly is forced to recover information from pointers. Which on the other side means, we don't really care about if the program uses pointers or arrays. As long as the data types behave like an, as an array, and LVM and consequently Poly understand the behavior, we, we just model them as arrays. Uh, yeah, the same, I probably said it already, is true for um, the induction variables and for you don't see the access function of the arrays because they are not arrays. But if you would have an array, Poly would understand them the same way as Pat would understand them. However, Pat requires the programmer to explicitly write an array, and Pat is a little bit more clever, so he can do some manual inline, like some inlining to, to kind of recover a couple of expressions. But basically, if you do not have control over your source code, um, Pat is very likely the program is very likely not in the form Pat will understand it. Um, so, if you want to try Poly, which is kind of in the middle of the talk, but you can still already try it, it's very easy to just download it, load it into the client compiler, um, use minus O3, minus Poly, and it will kind of like automatically optimize your C program without anything else. It will optimize for tileability and data locality, and if you add enable Poly of MD, it will also automatically detect parallelism and <coughs> take advantage of it using um, OpenMP. Um, so those are a couple of flags you can use. So there's poly report which basically tells you which code region we found something interesting. And for the people who are a little bit more involved in LVM, you can actually look into the LVM control flow graph. Here without statements, you can have statements. And we basically highlight the scopes we can detect. For scopes we cannot detect, we actually I didn't show it in this example, but we normally show at the top of those boxes um, error messages when a scope cannot be detected. And so, what is scopes? Oh yeah, scopes. This is uh, uh, actually a word that's incorrect, but uh, it's uh, like the abbrevi abbreviation for static control part, which is basically everything we we can handle with Poly. So actually, we can not only handle static control, and Poly can also not handle all static control, but basically, kind of like those restrictions like structure and control flow, structure and branches, um, yeah, there are a couple of more restrictions, so you need to have uh, FIN loop bounds, FIN array subscripts, so you don't want to have something like I times a parameter. Those are like basically having all those rules, and then when basically when Poly shows, shows something green here, that's what we call a scope, and that's where we apply the optimizations on. And <coughs> yeah, so so basically one thing I still wanted to say, so this is basically running Poly in Clang. It's, it's kind of, it's a good use case for Poly, but that's definitely not the only use case, and I actually think it's not the best use case. Poly is a framework of to, to write optimizations. A lot of those optimizations are very, very targeted to very <coughs> specific problems and very specific hardware, and we, for example, use this in PPCG to, 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 to generate CUDA code for certain applications. And I think that's where, where Poly is very, very powerful. The, the OpenMP, <coughs> is it using the pragmas or are you detecting automatically? We detect, we detect parallel loops. This right. is something very trivial. Like, after you 
got the scope and the representation detecting parallelism is trivial. Um, and so I just wanted to show you like one, 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 one transformation you could, for example, do. So we have again our two loops and a domain and a schedule. And what we now want to do is register tiling. And register tiling is very simple. You just kind of tile it by a two and two, and you kind of get this loop. But this is not a lot faster yet. So obviously for register tiling, we better unroll this stuff. And then we get this code, which is register tiled, but again, it's I'm not sure if it will be a lot faster because now we have this kind of boundary conditions here. And so one of the nice things um, we get using our polyhedral model and basically auto generating this code <coughs> from an abstract representation is not only that we kind of specify an option and the code is unrolled, which could probably do the LVM loop unroller also. The thing is that you can actually like unroll on a kind of semantically higher level. And this is kind of Unrolling combined with, I call it full touch partial tie separation. So basically, what we specified, I actually didn't, I didn't specify the option string here because it got a little bit more complex. But what we can do is basically, the reason for the conditions in the code is that some of your tiles, and just go back to the start. Actually, you don't get any full tile here. So basically, in this case, all the ties are partial ties. All the ties intersect with the boundary of the um, iteration space. So, so here you cut off, cut off the lower right corner. Here you cut off the left side. And actually, what you want to distinguish is those partial ties with the full ties that are actually 3 times 3 on all sides. And the nice thing without the polyhedral model and with actually the ISO code generation framework we have is basically we just give it a set of tiles in terms of like a mathematical representation for which we specify this is the set of full tiles and on the side we have the set of partial tiles. And that's exactly what we did here. And basically this code where you just have the four statement instances without any conditions are the full tiles. And all this code that I do not understand, maybe you got it, it's basically all the messy code you need to create to be still correct. This will never be executed. Oh, maybe one or two times. But this is kind of what you need for correctness, and this is what you need for speed. And that's how you basically implement a very simple register tiling using poly, using the IC generator. And so I know like there, there are some, some transformations in LVM. For example, the loop vectorizer actually does something like this on the innermost loop level. And my point is that basically if you do something more complex, go to more advanced tile shapes to go include more than one loop level. This code very, very quickly becomes very, very complicated. And if you reason about how to express this code in LVMIR, like that you need to generate two loops or three loops at different levels, have if conditions around them, have modular things, um, like getting this right on an LVMIR level is very, very difficult. On the polyhedral level, it's very, very simple, in fact, because we can, like, we provide it a schedule, and we can prove on the mathematical model that the schedule is correct. And then the code generator will just generate code for it that is correct. Oh, like It will also have bugs, but okay. <laughs> it may also have bugs, but it's, I, I, I still claim it's a lot easier to, to like rely on the code generator, which is more, normally a lot more reliable. And in case it is not, the test cases are normally a lot easier than a, like such a big test case where you actually, yeah, may fail. Um, so I, um, running out of time. No, I am also critical with the time. So um, this is just one example of how you can reason about a like more complex transformation even. So this is a three-dimensional iteration space. So basically three loops, and we also do a tile. This tiling is. Like you have basically one dimension here, one another dimension going up, and then one going out of the picture. And so those tile shapes are not rectangular, rectangular, but kind of like they are diamonds. So it's kind of skewed. They're still parallel. And well, this is a tiling that, for stencil computations, um, has shown to be very efficient. The reason for this tiling being efficient is basically uh, that you get two dimensions of parallelism. So, like we have a paper about that, and it's not really important how it actually works. The point is that the tile shape here is already a little bit more complex than I could actually imagine to implement on LDMIR. 
I also tell you this time trap is, is not optimal. Does anybody see the problem without actually understanding the question? <laughs> so one is green and the other is red. So I, I made this little red point here. And so, so the, the, the context and where we generate those tiles is we generate GPU code. Mm -hmm. And this dimension going upwards is the time dimension. And basically these little red points at the top means that at the very last time step within each tile, we have a single iteration that is executed on our GPU. This means one computation on an extremely highly parallel device, which is just extremely inefficient. So I wrote a nice paper about how to optimize this, and I said this is way better. Because now we have a lot more points on the top, we got a lot more parallelism, we can fully load our device. So even without you actually understanding the problem, you may get an intuition that they, this may be more efficient. So who is interested in implementing this on LBMIR? <laughs> Do you see how the code needs to look like? I actually, I had even with a mathematical model, I had no idea, so I was writing this ISL plotting to just generate the big pictures, and then I was proving by picture that it works. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so basically, this is like kind of some of the use cases where I say, like, if you have really a compute-intensive problem and you want, you, you you know you can do better than what a normal compiler can, um, I think those are tools that that make allow you to focus on the actual problem and yeah, forget about the low-level details. <coughs> there are a couple of research users already. There are so well, like. Um, companies using Volley, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to put them on the slides. So um, we're going to conclude. So Poly is a high-level loop optimization, optimization framework. It provides precise analysis and complex transformations. Um, there is an included automatic optimizer for data locality and handleability. You can test it on Clang, but um, the more interesting case is actually to adapt it for your own problems, for your specific hardware, for your specific target, and try if you can use basically the flexibility it gives you to, 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 to create new interesting optimizations. Yeah, well that's it, thanks a lot. We have maybe five minutes, because we need to start moving the tables. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So do you have actual figures how much poly can handle in real benchmarks? How much poly can handle? We I mean the scope, the number of scope that How can actually... So on the poly website there's actually there's one or two papers about uh, like Andreas Simberger did some work on how much scopes you can detect in a program. He was analyzing Postgres and then, then spec and a lot of stuff. And those numbers were not actually very good. In fact there was very very little coverage. And I think there are mainly two reasons for this. First of all um, like, like Databases like Postgres is just a use case, or like HTTP, like the web server Apache. Those are like use cases where you just won't find anything. Yeah. And then there are like the, the, the applications like video codecs, um, um, like high definition video codecs and stuff. And for this area, like I must say, like Pony is a reasonably major research project. And I know like some industry people actually put a lot of effort in making it even more major. But um, for actual real world software, you, 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 need, you really need to, 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 to put engineering effort in, 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 in making the front end really smooth. For example, for, for um, H.264, um, there's some computation that Poly can actually detect. But the core computation of H.264, for example, is just, well, it's basically it's a function pointer to an assembly implementation. So this is like the kind of highly optimized code, which is very difficult for Poly to detect. On the other side, um, I think Poly is still very useful for such cases because if you actually have the infrastructure to, to optimize your code, if it's written in a like without assembly code at the core computation, um, Poly can actually do a lot of stuff. And the other thing is that um, like some of the things we are looking into now, and, and we're basically uh, there are basically two two ideas I currently have personally to use poly. There are different people have other ideas. So one is basically like with this PPCG tool and stuff. So so we're basically um, thinking to, to, to making this um, like having a general purpose optimizer which then gets some um, intelligence to, to for example do some domain specific optimizations. This is specific for um, um, stencil computations. So in that case like poly could, could replace or like 
be, be similar to tools like, like, like Poshua without actually being domain specific. You just get domain specific speed within a general purpose framework. That's one thing. And the other thing is like, it's, I think it's very, very interesting, for example, like I've interned at the um, Google Render Script team to um, like, they have also like sev very similar problems they have. The render script kernels are reasonably simple as an input, so Poly can normally understand them, um, besides the render script specific stuff, but you can implement <laughs> that. And then the problem is you have compute intensive programs that need to be optimized, and you need very, very, very specialized optimizations to actually get good speed up on, on this uh, GPU hardware. And that's where the, one of the areas where you basically with a classical compiler optimization, um, you do not have the precision to actually generate very efficient GPU code. Yeah? Oh, okay. <laughs> for for uh, math libraries and uh, like Hammer, you know, uh, Markov models and all these things, because they are more GPU oriented, you might get a lot of Covered yeah. In those cases. So one of the other use cases actually, we we're, we're working with ARM on the car project, and one of the problems um, we, we are facing there is basically uh, ARM is having a hard time generating vendor libraries, like math libraries for a lot of the GPU uh, for for the um, configuration different configurations of the GPUs, because they just every vendor can kind of configure this device differently or his hardware. And basically, even for the, the classical BLAST libraries, it's, it, it, it becomes important to, to, to be able to auto-generate them. Yeah. And in this area, like, like this technique is kind of, you have all the precision you need, and you have basically, you can just throw with software on that problem. And so we're, we have one more year to go in, the, in this car project, and I think we will have some very interesting results. OK. So now there's another library that looks at the standard library before you generate the code. Again? I saw a uh, look.